I now want to introduce Dr. Lee Haynes from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine as our next speaker. Lee holds a PhD in Tropical Medicine and an MSc in Biochemistry and Microbiology. Her research interests focus on diseases that are spread by insects, particularly the relationships between insects, the microbiota and the diseases they transmit. Under this umbrella, she has been involved in lab and field-based projects that range from basic to translational science, such as investigating how gut bacteria impact the insect immune system, what sugars are present in Setsi milk. Lee has been a science lecturer and student mentor for more than 20 years and places high priority on supporting an educational journey that interweaves knowledge, creativity, collaboration and awe. She's also a science ambassador for public engagement, a regular speaker on BBC Radio Merseyside and is a champion for artistically communicating scientific concepts and complex data to help foster public understanding and curiosity. Lee's talk this evening is titled Fingers Intertwined, the Dynamic Bond Between Science and Art. What do extraordinary scientists and artists have in common? Both are fueled by curiosity and imagination, which drives them to venture into the unknown, a blank canvas, music not yet choreographed, an observation unexplained, a hypothesis not yet tested. Both seek to explain, inspire, provoke thought, communicate a deeper understanding to diverse audiences, and to create impact. Both embrace creative experimentation. What happens when it adds this pigment, this Reiku glaze, this cord, use that microscope, that chemical or that protocol? As a person who believes art and science should be inseparable, Lee will describe the value of integrating art into her own research on disease transmitting insects and how a deep appreciation for art transforms the way that she understands and communicates her own research. So, I'm really honoured to be here. This is fantastic for me to represent art from a scientist pr perspective. And I hope that I can entertain you and make you learn some things you didn't know and also show you how in my research particularly, there's so much interaction between art and science that for me it's very difficult to separate the two. So to start with, this is my talk and I have specifically put this picture of fingers entwined, not because I think that science is the adult or the child in this picture, but because it's a learning experience for both sides, like you have said already, that from an artist's perspective, you can gain such great insight as a scientist that I think it's a wasted resource and scientists should really be engaging more with the artistic community. So to do this talk, I thought it would probably be best to get some discussion with some artists that I uh, have the fortune of knowing. This artist here is um, an abstract artist in particular because what I look at through the microscope is oftentimes very abstract in appearance. He is a Canadian artist quite well known in British Columbia and he uses natural um, inspirations from nature to paint. And as you will see, it's, he does a lot of abstract work. And I am a vector biologist. This is me working in the field. So this gentleman's name is Barry Rafus. He is one of the senior members of the Federation of Canadian Artists, and it's a hard title to get in Canada. And he works with mixed media, he experiments, it's, it's incredible what he does. He has a large um, canvas, and then he decides whether or not he wants to get a certain texture in his canvas. So he'll think to himself, what if I put some salt on there? How will that deal with the watercolors? If I mix the acrylics with some alcohol, what will that do to the final product? So he's constantly challenging himself, learning, and then hopefully repeating so that he gets a desired effect again. So these are some of his works. Here's a few more. So you can understand it's quite abstract. But now for science and also I believe for art, at least the visual arts, it's really important to me to have some sort of context. And so if I put the titles now into these, does this now make more sense to you? Particularly the abstract lilies, you can start to see lilies. Transition could be an insect that's metamorphosing. Arctic ice, I think that's a no-brainer. It just definitely looks like Ar Arctic ice. Fly to the red wings. So in Canada, we have red wing blackbirds. And really, when they do fly and they emerge from the bulrushes, it's a flurry of black and red and browns. And he's captured that with this painting. But without the context, you would not know what this was. So for me, 
I love the fact that he's looking into a canvas, which is a landscape, and creating something that's unique and his own. I wish I had so much joy with that. But as a vector biologist, how many people know what a vector biologist is? If you've heard me on BBC Radio Merseyside, you'll know what it is. So a vector biologist is, is someone who studies vectors, which are insects, and these are specific insects that spread disease, so they're vectoring the disease. And my specialty is setsy flies. So that is a setsy fly. It's quite a big fly. If you've ever been on safari in Africa, it will have chased you, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Their bite is painful. Both the males and females take blood, and they both spread a disease called African sleeping sickness. It will kill you if you don't get treatment, and it also kills a lot of animals every year. So it's a large economic, causes a large economic burden on Africa. So at the School of Tropical Medicine, we have the largest breeding colony in the UK, which means an awful lot of satsi flies. Here you can see is our colony raised on trays. Inside of each one of those circular discs, which is really PVC piping, for those of you that recognize that. They are, there are 60 flies in there, and we have more than 10,000 flies. So to give you an idea, if we were to release all of those flies at the same time, starve them for a few days, and have you walk in there, you would probably die, because not that they sucked all your blood, but they would send you into toxic shock because you have got so much saliva in your system now, as well as you had probably more than 10% blood loss in your body. So it's a lot of flies to do that. It's not a dangerous place to work, though. They never escape. So here is a picture of me feeding, and we feed them horse blood. The horses do not die. We just harvest the blood once in a while. And the flies have to bite you through a membrane in order to drink the blood. So if we just put out a pool of blood for them to feed on, they can't just suck it up like a straw. They have to bite through to open up their mouth parts so that they can engage in um, drinking your blood or an animal blood. So that is the way they become infected. If there's an infected human or animal that has trypanosomes, which are these parasites in the blood, the fly will take that blood meal and there is a high chance that it will get infected in our lab. We have special flies. So the thing that I love about setsi flies that most people don't know is it's a unique fly. And what makes it unique? It doesn't lay eggs. This fly gives birth to a live baby, and the baby weighs more than the mum. So she is birthing a teenager. This is, the, this is the, what I want you to think in your head. So <laughs> as soon as she births that baby, it crawls off and goes underground to pupate for a month, and she kicks it away with great glee, and then almost rises onto her tippy toes because so much weight has left her body that she almost lifts off. So it's a very unusual life cycle for a fly. It makes it fantastic to study, particularly from her human perspectives, because she has a child that lives inside of her, in her uterus. The only thing different from humans, <laughs> in terms of this way, is that she has intrauterine milk glands. So she has a gland that seeps milk inside, and the larvae sit inside and lick up that milk. And then nine days later, the larvae is birthed. So it's a very fast process. It takes five seconds for that larvae to come out. The female's water breaks, and basically the baby backs out. Um, it's an unusual system. It doesn't look so nice either. But it is fascinating because you have a baby that's been drinking milk. You can know what the influence of the milk is in the biology of that system. And also, how does a female fly make milk? And it's literally, it's white thick milk with a really high fat content. So this begs the question. <laughs> Mark mentioned that one of my projects in the past was to look at what is inside of this milk, and can we get ideas for perhaps things that are similar to mammalian milk, in particular human milk, particularly when we start talking about prebiotics and probiotics. So how would you collect milk from a setsi fly? Um, well, you're going to have to ask me afterwards, because <laughs> I'm not going to tell you yet. But this kind of research, you might think, well, how on earth does science and art merge with this? Because this is really exploratory science, somewhat gruesome science. But there's a lot of beauty in it, as already mentioned. So here are some ideas about how I deal with science and incorporate art into it. So my tools are usually light and dyes to show up what we're seeing. And so this is an insect wing with normal bright field microscopy, which is what you all would be familiar with. And then this is what it turns into when you just add side lighting and the backdrop of black. 
very easy to see. We just color in slides with India ink and voila, you see all this beautiful detail, you see colors, and it helps identify species. So when you were speaking about how the seeds are, the seed project is informing the ecologist, this is exactly what we're seeing here, where you start to see details you never saw before that helps with the species identification in the fields. In another instance, how many people would recognize this? Any guesses as to what this is? These are, <laughs> this is tricky to say in my language, setsy testes. So these are the glands or the compartments that hold the sperm in the setsy fly. Setsy testes, it's horrific for spell check when you start typing these things. So they are two balls, they're orange, and they are filled with sperm, but you can't really see what's happening there. You can see the vast deferens and, and this kind of thing, but it doesn't really help me describe or see what's happening. But when we do staining, and this is a stain that shows up DNA, suddenly we get to see more architecture, we understand how things are organized, and it brings to question a whole new understanding, in a way, of what is happening inside of that. And can we age setsy flies now based on the patterns that we're seeing inside of the sperm? and the sperm inside of the, the setsy testes. <laughs> so this is something else that we have at LSTM, which is another vector called a kissing bug. This is not the bug, but this is its egg. And this is a great architectural wonder. When you look at this, it's a cup with a cap on the top. And when the baby emerges, it flips off the cap and comes out. Now, for those of you that are really sharp-eyed, you'll notice there's two different colors there. Any guesses as to what they mean? Angus? Nope. But good call. The top one is an egg that has been evacuated. The, the baby has left. So the lid has come off, and you see the lid right down here. So this is the lid that has popped off the top, and it's left. This egg is still intact. There's still a baby inside, and that's its eye. So the eggs themselves are not pink. It's the lar the, the um, nymph inside of them that are pink. So here's an example. When it emerges, that little tiny thing is completely packed inside of that vesicle. Now the whole idea of this kind of packing is also of great interest because this type of work, which just seems to be observational biology, can then lead into different things like comp compacting sciences and how, how do you squish something in and what kind of materials can this be used to give the rigidity and the architecture of those eggs to provide such a strong environment to resist desiccation of the eggs and to resist squishing of the eggs. So it might look very simple from this perspective, but there's so much to learn from this kind of um, investigation. This is the nymph when it emerges, and these are all its, I want to say, hatchlings, hatchmates. And you can see they quite quickly darken up into a brown-colored bug, and that's the baby that's just newly emerged stands out. So when I was thinking about this talk and getting things from, ideas from Mark about how to proceed with this, because it's quite a difficult talk. I'm used to giving scientific talks, not art-based talks. But I was always thinking this question, what do extraordinary scientists and artists have in common? And things that they don't. But they, they ended up having way more in common after talking with these artists. And the biggest thing I would say is that we challenge boundaries. You challenge boundaries in thinking and investigations. We're always driven by curiosity, and like I said, experimentation is the basis for both science and art. I think most scientists that I have discussed art with really like the idea that it provokes thought and discussions and makes you go beyond these boundaries. For me, I like to present the world from a unique perspective, and also I want to enlighten and inspire people to think outside of their own boxes. So <laughs> I believe that we have a very similar creative process, and we just use different words. So you were saying we use different languages, different grammar. We say hypothesis, and artists would be more likely to say idea. We say tests and experiments, they say practice. Replication, lots and lots of replicates in order to prove that what we're doing is seen time and time again. And with an artist, it's more about refining your skills, refining your um, brand, refining your ability to dance, whatever it might be, performing or visual arts. 
And then at the end, I think it's slightly different, but still the, the thing is you get to go, okay, these experiments are all done. This is the conclusion. I'm writing it up. I'm going to sit by my paper and it's over. And with an artist, they're all striving to do the piece, finish the piece, market the piece, send it out to the audience. So very similar perspectives. And we came up with a bunch of questions that we could ask myself and the artist that I was consulting. How do I captivate you and provoke you to respond to me? What tools do I need to use to get the desired effect? Do I need context? How should I tell my story? Should I do it on an audience like this, an art-based audience, or should I do it to primary school teachers, or who? Who do I need to give my message out to? And will my work be recognized? For a scientist, that's very important because we don't get funding unless our work is recognized. For an artist, you don't get fame or asked to do um, performances or installations if you're not recognized. So we're both striving to be recognized by the public. And as a scientist, this is what I really want to do. I want to translate my data and knowledge into something that's visually compelling so that I can tell you a story and that you will remember the story. Because you'll remember that, not my data. I want to generate an emotion that makes you think and hopefully changes the way you thought about things before. And then I want to inspire the next generation. And I believe that artists all feel the same way about this. So I have a question for you. If you look at this, do you see a painting? Do you see art? Do you, do you see uh, through a microscope? This, this is my dilemma, because I'm looking at that, and I actually see something different than I'm sure what you're seeing. Because this is based off of a microscope image that I took down the top of the microscope. This is a shredded gut of a setsy fly. All of these sparkles that look like a galaxy, just for you. <laughs> I should ask you what you thought of this. These are all trypanosomes that diffract light differently, and they spread across, and they're swimming, so this is a very motion-filled picture. And all of these are the fat bodies which store the lipids and the fats of the insects so that they can survive and, and withstand a lot of stresses. So I look at this and go, oh, that's a terrible photomicroscopy image. But it does tell a very interesting story that, yes, I have an infected fly. I get to score this as a positive result in my experiments. But at the same time, if you don't look at the beauty of that, or at least translate it into something that someone might think, wow, that's a really interesting piece. I wonder where the inspiration came from. Don't ever tell them what the inspiration came from. <laughs> But it's, it's fascinating to me how these two can merge. So in this case, who is the scientist? Who is the artist? Is there a difference in this case? I don't think so. So I believe that scientists should be creative, and artists should be analytical. And I think that it's happening already, but we don't necessarily give scientists the license to be creative, nor artists the license to become analytical. We all follow this same stream of learning, experiment, learn, transfer our knowledge to the next generation, and then generate new ideas. And then this leads to communicate, which is what I'm doing here with you tonight, and why you're here, because you want to learn and listen. So I have one more thing. What, how we are incorporating our science into the artistic communities is I have a collaboration with this artist, Tessa Farmer. She's based in London. And she works with dead insects that she collects, so nothing in, the, in her works have been killed. And she creates these things called fairy skeletons. So if you look, they're little tiny skeletons made out of tree roots. And she creates a story about these skeletons wanting to take over the world, and they have all the horrific negative features of a human being. And so what we've done, and one of the many things she does, is creates like a scene where she has put the fairy skeletons, and in this case, this is a tea party. And she's made this for me, and it's lovely. And if you look very close, you'll see that inside of the different containers, this is filled with setsy eyeballs. And so she's using it in her installation to show how there is this merger between art and science. This is the size of the, setsy, of the fairy skeleton, and it's made with setsy wings attached to it. So for me, this is a great way to use all of our dissection material that normally just gets binned but it has value to somebody else. And I like to feed that value. So on closing, I would just like to say that this artist is my father. And so I know a lot about how he creates, how he's created all my life. And um, it's really nice to be here at the Tate, 
representing what he has taught me over the years and what I've taken on board as a scientist. Thank you.